So 65 is the current scientific number we shoot for. It's our target goal, mean arterial pressure, and that is to perfuse organs adequately. Below that, we risk hypoperfusion of organs, so we want to do things that make it get above 65, whether it's give fluids, or if we think there's enough fluid, we give pressors, and so that's your MAP. And the nice thing is, there's a way to calculate the fraction of like systolic, diastolic, how to divide whatever. It may be on a test sometime. I forgot it long ago. It's right there in the monitor. You'll see the blood pressure, and then in nice parentheses behind it, you see the MAP. So it's right there in every monitor. It tells you what the number is, and that's what I follow. Other than that, anybody know why we get like neurogenic shock and what the findings are, and septic, and cardiogenic, and hypovolemic? You guys have any idea of that? Because I like to teach common sense. I don't, you're going to see a lot of terms and numbers and percentages, and I hate it all. I hate percentages. I don't teach percentages because that's not what you're going to see in the field. You're never going to come on scene of a call with a GI bleeding patient, and they're down and they're pale and diaphoretic and they're tachycardic and they're dying, and you're going to say, I estimate the blood loss to be 750 mLs. That means they're at stage 2 hypoperfusion shock. You're not going to ever do that. You're going to see this dying guy, and you're going to click into, I need to save them. I'm going to quickly assess them. Here's what I think I need to do. So I want to teach common sense, what you're going to see, why you're going to see it, and how to predict what's going to happen. So is anybody a really good artist of anatomy in the class? Know how to draw heart, lungs, where the blood flow goes? No? <laughs> so what we'll do is kind of talk through why you see the findings you see in certain types of shock, and then how, by the end of the talk, I'm hoping you'll kind of go, oh, okay, I don't need to know all the data, all the crap that goes with this. I can go on scene, see a person who dove into shallow water, pull them out, and, that, and I know now why they look all red, their cap refills one second, they're not moving their limbs, but their blood pressure is really low, and their heart rate's low. I know exactly why that. Cool. So as we go through this, I'm going to skip some slides. Some slides just have way too in-depth of stuff that you just don't ever need to know. And so we'll skip it. If you have questions as we go, stop. Just throw something out there. I don't care if you interrupt. Stop and ask your questions. <coughs> Obviously, the outline, we'll go through this stuff. Okay? Shock. It drives me nuts when you see a news article, people interviewing somebody after a car crash or house fire, and the victim was in shock. And you see this lady or guy sitting on the curb crying. They're not in shock. I mean, that's like the bystander version of shock. Shock is hypoperfusion, low MAP, dying patient that we need to fix. So how do we define what is shock? We've already went through this. Inadequate perfusion of organs. The organs start to die because all organs like blood. Because blood brings what? Oxygen. No oxygen. You go into anaerobic metabolism. And what do you get out of anaerobic, no oxygen metabolism? You go out for a marathon, halfway through, you're kind of done breaking down what you can break down with oxygen, then you convert into anaerobic, and you're going to get some energy, but acid. So metabolism is to produce energy for your body, but if you're breaking down the wrong way without oxygen, not getting perfusion, you're going to get less efficient processes, so less energy, but acid with it, and that's why people start to crap out on you. So hyperperfusion is the big topic of the whole shock thing, okay? And this is a utilization versus, you know, demand versus supply, okay? Very simple. High demand, you have an, a sepsis patient, horrible urinary infection in an 80-year-old female, you come on scene, you're going to see this a gajillion times in your career, so burn this one in your memory. Elderly, female, or male, usually female, because the urinary tract is so short. And you come on scene, and it's a confused lady who may have fell, broke a hip, but she's confused. That's why she fell and broke her hip. So the call is because grandma broke her hip. But you get there, grandma's a little confused, and this is new confusion, started days ago, kind of gradually. 99% of the time, she's got a urine infection, made her confused, fell, broke her hip. That's gonna, you're going to see it a lot. And she may even smell like urine and make it easy for you. But it's all supply and demand. So her infection made her body need more energy. Okay, she's fighting a cold, right? So your body goes into fight mode. I got to beat this cold, beat this infection. So you're utilizing more 
burning up more, metabolizing more, and the body can't keep up, and you go into shock. Pretty simple, right? Everybody's got a reserve tank. It's just your reserve tank is a lot better than an 80 year So we already talked about acid accumulates with anaerobic metabolism. So no flow, no oxygen, anaerobic, acid. Simple enough, right? You're already getting shock. It's pretty simple. Acid builds up, and like we talked about the lethal triad of trauma, acid never really good in the system in the body, right? There's not really a point of your metabolism or life cycle where more acid is good. Talk about diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, it's none of it's good. So in regards to shock, you got different things. So the heart is obviously the pump. The conduits are all the vessels, mainly the arteries, and the blood is obviously the fluid running through everything you feel. So does anybody know, and I don't expect you to know this, the neurologic system in the body? Okay, you have a, a, neuro, a neurologic chain, your sympathetic chain that goes down kind of near your aorta, and it controls things. Does anybody know how the neurologic system controls the arteries? A little bit the veins, but the arteries are really important here. So this right here, this will tell you neurogenic shock, and you'll be able to figure neurogenic shock out for the rest of your life. The, the nerves actually control how tight those arteries are, whether they're constricted nice and tight, or kind of loose and flabby and full of blood and can't pump anything. So what would be easier? Okay, you're all, a lot of you probably are firemen or still are firemen, right? Some. So what's easier to like spray water all over the house? A tight, firm, new fire hose with a certain amount of pressure or this old flabby loose hose with a certain amount of pressure? You want the tight hose, right? You can blow water everywhere. So the nerves control that diameter. Okay? And if you have good nerve function, they keep things tight. It's not the opposite. So nerve function intact to the arteries keeps things nice and firm, tight, and gives you good blood pressure. It controls the blood pressure. If you take out the nerves, have somebody dive in, spinal trauma, shot in the back, whatever it is, you lose that nerve conduction, the arteries now lose their nerve conduction instead of remaining tight and controlling the blood pressure, they go loose. And now what happens to your blood pressure? The tanks. So there's neurogenic shock. And now everything tanks, the arteries open up, but you're not losing blood. So how are the extremities going to look if all the arteries open up? They're going to look warm, red, perfused. So there's neurogenic shock. You've lost all control of your artery tightness. Everything opens up, blood pools. You see red extremities, good cap refill, warm patient, but yet they're dying of shock and they're hypotensive. And why is their heart rate low instead of high? It's all nerve related, right? It's all neurogenic regulated stuff. So that's why in a neurogenic shock, you see a low heart rate with a low blood pressure. Whereas in any other kind of shock, what's the body's normal mechanism for, oh crap, I'm not getting enough blood flow to the brain. What's your body gonna do? Jack up your heart rate is number one, two, and three. And then after that, lots of different things are gonna happen. But there, is it starting to kind of make common sense of certain shock? Here's the responses. So the nerves are like, your blood pressure is low because you're kind of like moving out ah. everywhere, and then other types of shock is keep moving in so your blood pressure yeah. goes up? So the nerves are still intact in like septic shock, hypovolemic. And so let's say somebody shoots me in the chest right now and I'm gushing blood out of my wound and into my chest cavity. All my body systems, all the arteries, there's certain areas like in the femur and the uh, carotid arteries, they have what's called baroreceptors, pressure sensors. And those are direct conduit to the brain to say, pressure's good here, you're good, keep the regulation where it's at. And the nerves tighten down. And if the pressure's too high, those baroreceptors say, chill out a little bit, let's loosen up, and the arteries open up and blood pressure stays where it should be. And so what would happen if somebody shoots me, I'm gushing blood out, what do the arteries in my feet, what are they being told? Bingo. The nerves are still functioning, my brain's functioning, it's telling the whole body, listen, we're shutting down anything that is killable, we don't care if you lose your feet, we care about the brain, the liver, all these organs, we're going to shunt blood there to save your life and keep you alive. Screw the feet, screw the hands, screw the nose, ears, we don't need them. So shut down blood flow there, we're moving it, moving all the blood flow to the core. So that's why in most shock, you see 
Hy you know, hypoperfused pale skin on the fingers, poor cap refill, <coughs> feet look cold and white, um, and septic shock's the same way because it's shunting blood. But neurogenic, you lose control of that, that function to tighten things down and close off blood flow, and instead everything opens up, so you get red extremities, warm blood. So, inadequate pump, what kind of things can knock out your heart? Okay, it's pretty simple. How do you kill a pump? How do you kill, how do you kill your heart, aside from a gunshot or a knife wound? Okay, and your heart gets blood through the coronary arteries. So how do you take out a coronary? Heart attack, right? Blockage in a coronary vessel, heart attack, the heart pump goes inefficient, it can't pump the blood very well, and now you have cardiogenic shock. So if the pump gets taken out, you can't perfuse because the pump sucks. The vessels may still be good, the nerves are still good, but your pump sucks. And so you can't even get the blood there because you got a crappy pump. So you hear things like the Frank Starling. All that is is that the heart is a reactionary tissue, and the more it fills up, the more it pumps harder. That's a normal heart. That's your heart and most people's hearts. But if people have long-term high blood pressure, it's like going to the gym every day. You work out, your muscles get big, right? Maybe not mine, but some people's. But go, go work out, you get big muscles, that's what you want. You don't want your heart to do that. Your heart's a big muscle as well, and you don't want your heart to get big and tough. So people that have high blood pressure for years untreated, their heart is so used to pumping so hard. Every day it's like going to a gym. It gets firmer, bigger, tougher, and when it contracts, it's not as efficient as what it used to be. And that's why you get people CHF. Long-term high blood pressure, remodels the heart, crappy pump, and they don't get that fill like it used to. All right, we'll breeze through some of this stuff because really we're talking concepts here. And that's fine. Glucose breakdown, anaerobic versus, all you have to pull away from this, don't, don't memorize anything here. The gist of it is anaerobic metabolism, where you don't have oxygen, you get a little amount of energy plus acid. Pyruvic, which gets converted to lactic acid through a different process. Whereas if you have oxygen, aerobic, you get more energy, a little mitochondria, oxygen becomes, you need more energy and no acid production. Much more efficient process. So compensation. So let's go more into natural body functions. We've heard about sympathetic versus parasympathetic, right? The nervous systems. When does your parasympathetic system really activate and kick in? The relaxation part. Sleep. What happens while you're sleeping? <coughs> what happens usually every morning for people? <coughs> A bowel movement, right? And that's normal because at night your parasympathetic kind of homeostasis, housekeeping system kicks in. You sleep, you're relaxed, your guts work, they process food, they're really active, and uh, you wake up, have a bowel movement, start your day. So let's talk about the classic sympathetic, fight or flight, right? You hear about that all the time. So let's truly talk about fight or flight. You're in an alley, somebody shoots a gun at you, you're freaking out, you go into fight or flight, sympathetic nervous system. What body responses are going to happen? What's your heart rate going to do? Okay, why? Not just because, ah, oh, gunshot, I'm scared. Because your body's now trained, I'm going to have to run, fight, kick ass, do all sorts of stuff, and I need a fast heart rate for it. I need more blood to all these tissues and calf muscles. I need to bust it. Move. What are your eyes going to do? It's nighttime. Dilate. Dilate so you can see better. You're now like a predator, right? Or a prey, which way are you looking at it? Uh, blood pressure is obviously going to go up to perfuse all these organs that need blood flow. Your arteries are going to tighten down. Nothing's going to be relaxed. What's your gut going to do? A lot of people have that sudden spasm, they crap their pants, right? But it's going to shut down, okay? Your gut's going to shut down, and all of a sudden, whereas you had to have a bowel movement a little bit ago, now you can run five miles without stopping because you're so scared and you never had to poop. When you get done, you realize, wow, I had, to, I had to pee and poop really bad before this all started, and I don't have to now. So that's the difference between parasympathetic and sympathetic. And so when it comes to shock, just remember those things, and that's kind of what's going to happen. All right, so we talked about the baroreceptors, pressure sensors. There's also chemoreceptors, chemical uh, sensors, necrotid sinuses, and they measure oxygen, carbon, carbon dioxide, and that kind of stuff, and they'll help tell things to ramp up or not. Again, really, it's just so you know that there are sensors throughout your body that help regulate things. 
We talked about parasympathetic and sympathetic. Now, a bit about the adrenal glands. Again, this is getting really in depth. This is stuff that goes back to uh, physiology, biochem. So the adrenal gland glands are sitting on top of each kidney. They're like a little triangle <coughs> gland you see on pictures. And they have uh, a cortex, an outside, and an inner part called the medulla. They make uh, hormones. And so they make everything from cortisol to help regulate metabolism and how you use glucose. But they also make um, things like angiotensin, and uh, antidiuretic hormone, and aldosterone. And these hormones help regulate certain body functions. So if we're talking about the vessels and whether you shut things down to save blood flow and shunt it to the core for that bleeding patient, where the vessels open up with neurogenic shock, uh, these glands help secrete things that help regulate that. So your adrenaline, the epinephrine, norepinephrine, Norepinephrine is converted to epinephrine. So you make norepinephrine, it's then converted to epinephrine, which then you use in your body systems. <coughs> Generally, it's, it's called adrenaline. We still give it. Nobody's allergic to it. You make it in your own body. Um, but the gist of it is it's your fight or flight. So it's going to do all those things that jack you up. Heart rate, blood pressure. Uh, we give norepi, called levofed. You come across that eventually. And that's a blood pressure support medication, a very potent one. It's our go-to for sepsis and hypovolemic shock. After you've filled up the tank with these fluids and they're still hypotensive, we'll jump to leave with that. And the goal of it is to tighten down those arteries again, maintain pressure, increase the heart rate. It's just kind of an all-around jack-em-up medication. Get the blood pressure and heart rate back up. And then you have your anti-diuretic hormone. What's a diuretic? I'm, I'm drinking one right now, coffee. Yeah, it makes you pee. Diuresis means pee. And so anti-diuretic, stop peeing, so it retains fluid. So an anti-diuretic hormone, the goal is you're losing too much, you're dehydrated, I'm gonna, the brain's going to secrete more anti-diuretic uh, stimulation to the adrenals, secrete more anti-diuretic hormone, so you stop peeing. So that's why in shock patients, we see decreased urine output. The body's responding to say, we're losing too much of something, regardless of what it's for, we need to stop losing and start retaining. So all these things kick in. Things constrict, heart rate goes up, you're secreting hormones to help you retain fluid. Aldosterone, anybody know what aldosterone does? It's a salt hormone. It tells the kidneys to stop losing salt. Keep salt. Why? What follows salt? Water. 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 So look at all these mechanisms kicking in to tell the body, stop losing, we need to keep gaining. Stop losing everything, we need to keep fluid. So it starts retaining salt, so you retain water. So, pretty simple stuff. When you start failing compensation, we'll go through it, but there's you know, different levels to decompensated. And is there a point when you're treating a patient someday who's in shock where you're going to go, they just passed from decompens or from compensated shock to <coughs> decompensated <coughs> irreversible. Are, there, are you going to be able to sit there and look at the patient and go, oh yes, their pulse just changed five points. They are now irreversible. Let them go. <laughs> no. There's never a measurable, defined moment. Patient <coughs> care is never <coughs> measurably defined, right? It's this continuum of the proverbial something going through the fan, right? It's this constant change of you start something and a few minutes later, is it working? Let's reassess things. Or they're just keep getting worse and we're going to keep doing stuff and you're never sitting there saying they're in stage three. Yes, now we treat them this way. It's never going to be that way. The books will talk about stages one, two, three, and like everything you study, it's all BS. The patient's never going to say, I'm in stage three shock right now. And you're never going to say, they're in stage three shock right now. It's not possible. It's this constant continuum. So, like somebody said earlier, the pendulum is swinging. Years ago, 100 years ago, medicine and EMS care was, you fix the patient. F the numbers. Who cares what the numbers are? What do you have in front of you? And treat that. And then we had all this amazing science and Google Scholar and all this grant money and tons of stuff. All the science came and the numbers came and D-dimer levels and these lab tests and the maps and all blood pressure and, and the pendulum swings to the other way of treat the numbers. And now we're recognizing, that's really stupid. Why are we treating numbers? Why do I have nurses running up to me saying, 
you got to come see this patient, their blood pressure, their blood pressure. I run in the room thinking i got a dying patient. i got a guy watching TV with the remote control, the blood pressure like 210 over 110. Now, blood pressure is impressive, great. Look at him. He's not dying. He feels great. I'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, like treat the patient, look at what's in front of you, only freak out if you have something to freak out about, but then don't panic. Freak out and know what to do. So reversible shock, you're never going to know when you're there. Irreversible, reversible, you just keep treating the patient with what you think you need to do. <coughs> so yes, there are three different ones, compensated, uncompensated, reversible. There's a continuum, you're never going to know which one you're in. So the gist of it is your initial shock state where things are still changing, you see some compensation, their heart rate's jacked up, but they're still maintaining blood pressure, they're still talking to you normally, but then all of a sudden they start getting confused, maybe they're going into decompensated. You, you're never going to know. And so it gives these little things with each one. I don't care if you memorize compensated, uncompensated. That, that doesn't, I don't care about that. What I care about is that you can recognize this guy's pale. Pale means his arteries are clamped down. He's shunting blood. Oh, yeah, okay, so his body is responding to whatever the heck's going on inside there. That's, that's significant. Clammy skin, moist. Okay, it's not underlined, it's not bolded. A diaphoretic patient, you can't fake that, right? You're going to see a lot of people who are like, oh, my pain's 12 over 10. Just wait, i got to text my girlfriend. <laughs> like, you're going to see that all the time, right? You can fake pain, you can fake cry, you can fake suicide, you can fake all these things. Chest pain, you can fake it all. You can't fake diaphoresis. People can pour a bucket of water over their head. You're going to look at it and go, it looks like they poured a bucket of water over there. You can't fake sitting on a chair and you have beads of sweat all over your forehead, chest, and this clammy feeling. It's not like Ferris Bueller where he licks his palms. Diaphoresis is something you can't fake, and it's the one thing on a patient, if I walk in a room and I see a diaphoretic patient, it's one of the very few things that I'll go, something interesting's happening here, this is not good, I need to take some time to figure this out. It's like the one thing I might pucker up a little bit at. Dying patient, hypotensive, that's all stuff you just follow the algorithms and fix them. Diaphoresis tells you something wrong is happening. <coughs> sitting, sitting in a in the ER gurney or in the back of an ambulance in this kind of weather is diaphoretic, not good. So anxious, a lot of our patients are going to be anxious, right? Um, tachypnea, tachycardia, usually that's pretty uncomfortable stuff as well. <laughs> so you're never going to know if they're going to be decompensated. You're going to keep treating them. The blood pressure is eventually going to start getting low when they can't, can't keep things going very well. And then they go into this irreversible, and you hear this multi-system organ failure. Yes, it's what they technically get before they die. Somebody coined it probably in some research article, and it turned out to be this cool phrase that people liked in the whole shock teaching. Are you going to know when they're in multi-system organ failure? <coughs> You're still going to have a diaphoretic guy who's tachycardic, hypotensive and they haven't peed in a day anyway. When did they go into organ failure? I don't know. Are their kidneys really not working? I don't know, they're not peeing. Do I, do I care in the field as an EMS provider they're not peeing? It's just another sign that maybe they're in shock. Maybe they have urine retention because they have catheter problems, I don't know. So I don't really go by the whole low urine output. If you put the whole picture together, tachycardia, hypotension, pale, diaphoretic, not peeing, then yeah, that's shocking. Now the classifications, we used to have cardiogenic, hypovolemic, neurogenic, anaphylactic, etc. And then they made it really complicated and added a whole bunch. Okay? It's still pretty simple. Your most common is hypovolemic, losing too much blood. What else can you lose to be hypovolemic? Fluids. How do you lose a buttload of fluids? I gave you a hint. Burns, diarrhea, C. diff patients, um, burn patients, yeah, where they're leaking fluid all over, gastroparesis patients, or gastroenteritis where they're vomiting constantly and they can't keep up their fluid intake. So cardiogenic, we talked about obstructive. This one they added. So things that block flow can cause hypoperfusion too, right? So a big blood clot sitting in their lungs, blocking flow, a big blood clot or aortic dissection where they can't get flow down the aorta. Hypoperfusion. Does that make sense? Tamponade. 
Do you know what tamponade is? It's scary as hell is what it is. It's part of the sac around the heart starts filling the floor. Yeah. The pericardium is the sac around the heart. That's why you can sit here and not feel every heartbeat. It's because it's sitting in this amazing sac that is somehow able to completely take away the sensation of a heart constantly beating in your chest and moving and wiggling. And the heart sits in it and it's never irritated. If it is irritated, you know it. It's called pericarditis. And people get this horrible, sharp chest pain, worse when they lay flat. Usually it's a couple weeks after a viral cold, and they come in, they have pericarditis. If you have tamponade, that's when fluid starts to build up. And you can have it from inflammation, from like pericarditis. You can get it from um, cancer. You can get it from some medications. Uh, but blood building up in there from trauma, uh, an aortic uh, injury up there, or a knife wound that ruptures the heart and bleeds in that pericardium. That sac does not stretch. It is a fibrous, tense material. If you ever, if you ever bring in a patient into the ER with a gunshot or a knife wound to the chest and we crack their chest, pretty rare, but we do it sometimes, uh, stick around because you get to see all this cool anatomy, and you'll see the pericardium. It's this white sac, and we'll take a scissors and cut through it and create a window in it to let the blood out of it, and then the heart can pump again. But that sac is so tense, if you fill it with blood, the heart's got nowhere to go, and it just gets smaller and squished, and pretty soon gets the most inefficient pump ever. It can't pump anything. It can't fill. So you get severely hypotensive, and you just crump. And unless somebody goes in and cuts that pericardium open, you're a goner. No matter what you do in the field, they're a goner. Okay? And then you get into this distributive. And that just means you're having a hard time distributing blood for one of these reasons. I, I think I just had a hard time thinking of how do we group these, what's a good term to use it. So. They gave it distributed, and that includes sepsis and neurogenic, and that's because uh, you're not distributing because of this problem with the arteries, and things are opening up too much. So cardiogenic, we already talked about. Damage to the pump, you can't pump blood. Okay, so this is easy, we can breathe through this one. Now with cardiogenic, think about, all right, right here. So you have your heart sitting in your chest, and arms, and then you have your lungs, right, on the side. So you got the vessels pumping blood into each lung. So if you go into cardiogenic shock, where the pump is not pumping anymore, so you've got blood that wants to go out the aorta in the back here, it goes down. So the pump is not getting blood out here. So it's not doing a good job. There's some, but it sucks. It's really inefficient. Your heart's crapped out. You get a heart attack. So if you're not pumping blood out the main vessel, where's blood backing up into? It's backing up. But where's it going to go if blood is coming in, but it's not getting out? So it starts backing up. Where so it wants to, blood wants to come out of the lungs and then pump out the aorta. Now you're getting blood backing up into the lungs, and what's going to happen? How's that patient going to look? Yeah, so what's a patient full of fluid and back up into the lungs and fluid in the lungs look like and sound like? Wet. <coughs> wet. You listen to both sides, they're going to be pretty equal, <coughs> and they're going to have a wet cough. They're going to, lung sounds are going to sound like they have gurgling fluid in there, and might even have frothy sputum, which is... Right up above diaphoresis in my book is one of the scarier things you see patients do. They're producing froth and liquid out their mouth. <laughs> but, yeah, you, better, you better get them in real quick, because that's not good. So you get backup. So if you take out the pump, you get back of the fluid into the lungs, and then get back of the fluid into the veins that we're feeding into the heart, and backing up the veins causes edema. CHF. So CHF is basically take out the heart, make a crappy heart, fluid, lungs, fluid, and legs, and if it gets bad enough and your heart's not pumping good enough, you have hypotension, look like crap, they start constricting down because they're not getting blood anywhere, so the heart, the body's saying save blood, save blood, get it to the uh, internal organs. So obviously any treatment in the field, IVOT, EKG, keep the patient warm, Get an ID. So we'll skip this stuff, okay? Put the monitor on. That's all common sense. 
So hypovolemic shock, we always talk about trauma because that's the most common cause of hypovolemic shock. And most common age is our age, the young people, the car accidents, that kind of stuff. But you can also have internal bleeding, most common GI bleed. So a person with weeks of this constant slow GI bleeding ooze can eventually become so anemic that they're now hypoperfusing and the body finally goes into shock. So it doesn't have to be everything started that day. You may get called to a scene where this patient's been compensating slowly for so long that the story is, it's been going on for about a week. They're just getting worse. So you're, immediately you're crossing off shock off your list because a week onset. But then you check out the patient, again, pale, hypoperfused, maybe getting confused. They look shocky, they're tachycardic. And you can't figure out why. There's, there's no infection, they're not coughing, they're peeing normally. They don't smell like urine. And so when you have those cases, generally start thinking GI bleed. Because this is the kind of thing where people don't even know they're doing it. A lot of people don't look at their stool, or they see some black stool, and they go, oh, I must have ate something funny. And they've had black stool for two weeks. <coughs> so GI bleeding, oozing, can be this insidious cause of shock. And it's the kind of shock that they come in, everybody sees them, they're in shock. And now we're all trying to figure out, why the hell are they in shock? Why are they hypotensive, tachycardic, pale? They're in shock, but why? A lot of times the answer is in the body. Hypovolemic shock, they get altered eventually. So don't rely on altered mental status as a, a sign of shock. If you got it, that's a big deal. But it only complicates things, right? If they're altered, is this a stroke? Did they dissect a carotid? I mean, lots of people are altered. Are they drunk? They do some drugs, meth, whatever? <coughs> Who knows? So altered mental status, while bad, and never good, it's not guaranteed going to tell you if it's one thing or the other. All right, let's get through a bunch of this stuff that we went through. We talked about neurogenic and why the vessels open, right? So you kind of get that now where the nerves control artery diameter and good nerve function means nice and tight. Take out the nerves, everything loosens up and goes and just blood fills all the extremities but doesn't get to the, the organs that need it. Oh, also, so you take out that sympathetic drive and you lose your function of the adrenal gland which makes it even worse, because now you lost the epinephrine, and you lost all the other stuff that goes with it, the aldosterone, the ADH. And this is why then you see a warm, dry, red patient who's hypotensive and bradycardic, typically. All right, again, IV, O2, EKG, keep the patient alive, breathe for them, tube them, whatever, whatever you need to do. Pneumothorax. Anybody seen a pneumothorax? Cool. You'll see them in your career for sure. Keep it in your mind always of that short of breath patient. Do a good lung exam and trust your exam. One side, decreased breath sounds. They may be present, but decreased. Doesn't have to be absent. Just decreased on one side with lung trauma or a history of asthma or COPD. Think pneumothorax and then start <coughs> going through your things of like, how do I figure out this pneumothorax? Talk about tamponade, pulmonary embolisms, a blood clot to the lungs. It typically comes from the legs. Most commonly after you had a recent surgery, you're immobilized, so you're in bed for a long time, and the blood built up in your leg forms a clot, and then it eventually flows downriver and goes into the lungs, which act like giant clot filters. Uh, other things that can bump up your risk of clots, cancer, pregnancy, uh, being taken off, your blood thinners will do it. Long car rides, plane rides, train rides, that's a risk factor. And the whole reason they build up your legs is because um, what pumps the blood out of your legs against gravity is just muscle movement, walking around, doing activity. Muscles contracting, they pump the venous blood out of the legs. So if you're immobilized, you're not getting up moving around, real sedentary, really obese patients laying in bed all day, more prone to clots. Uh, Bex triad. You're probably going to see that in a test at some point. Okay. Um, remember these things. It can help you out in regards to figuring out if it's uh, tamponade or uh, pneumoth or pneumothorax or pulmonary embolism. The X triad comes into play if you have kind of backup in the lungs uh, or a problem with the heart pumping blood. And you'll see the JVD, the muffled heart tones, and that's typically going to be tested for pericardial tamponade because the muffled heart tones is from the blood or fluid in the sac. Um, what's the tamponade? Are are the diastolic and systolic really close to each other? 
There's no guarantee. No, I wouldn't try to memorize any of that. Right? But you, you'll hear muffled heart tones, you'll see hypotension, tachycardia, and a patient who looks like crap. And that's fairly consistent. That's not just like theoretical. That's pretty, pretty typical. You don't have to see the JVD. If I see a muffled heart tone patient who's hypotensive, tachycardic, I'm going to do a pretty quick ultrasound of the heart. Is the JVD a more of a late sign? Uh, no, it doesn't have to be. JVD you can see pretty commonly with any kind of backup into the lungs, uh, CHF, um, pericardial tamponade. But it's something that you got to be looking for. Some people, but pretty rarely is it so obvious, you see a huge worm in the neck. Pretty rarely do you see that. Uh, and technically, to, to check for JVD, there's this ridiculous thing of they have to be at like 10 degrees or 30 degrees, and you have to have a ruler and measure this high up. Like most things in medicine that are measurements, it's, just, it's a waste. Total waste. And so uh, check out patients once in a while, do good physical exams, and you'll come across it and say, oh, interesting, I think that's JVD. Uh, if the patient's laying down, it's pretty easy to get JVD. But if they're sitting up at an angle and they've got big worms in their necks, that's pretty pronounced JVD. And then if you hear wet lung sounds and see edema, you're pretty, pretty right on with JVD. Hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is always fun. Hemorrhage is easy. Okay, right? Bleeding. It either all stops at some point, right, or you fix it. Simple. So hemorrhage is really simple in regards to how do we fix it? How do you fix a bleed? Pressure. Sure. Pressure. Yeah, how easy is that, right? Push on it. If you push on, let's say you got a nice spurting, somebody cut their wrist here, they're trying to kill themselves, you got a good arterial bleed, and you push really hard here and it's still oozing. Okay, what's another thing you could try to do? How about before turn? Pressure point. Elevation. Pressure point. Elevation, both. Where could you go for a good pressure point if it's not working here? Yeah, like we're doing babies. Find that brachial, crunch on it, elevate the arm. You might get enough improvement that you can get a nice tight wrap around it and hopefully stop it or find the pressure point here that works better. And so direct pressure works great for about anything. Um, just FYI. Lay people get really freaked out by blood, even you know, with nosebleeds, <laughs> and it's it's hilarious actually. Um, and so get used to ed educating your population when you're out doing stuff or picking up the nosebleed patient who's scared at the age of 20 that they're bleeding. Um, and get good at being a good educator of how to stop a bleed. You know, direct pressure on the soft part, uh, direct pressure here. Show them how to do a pressure bandage. Don't show people how to do tourniquets because inevitably they screw it up. Um, but yes, tourniquets are wonderful, and we'll talk about it. So bleeding types. Obviously, you skin and skin up your knee. You get oozing blood. That's capillary. Venous, venous hemorrhage. I'm not sure really if you can have a venous hemorrhage, but uh, venous bleeding, even massive. Let's say you get a massive laceration to the thigh, and you nick a big venous vessel. Um, that bleeding is going to be heavy duty. It's going to feel to you like it's arterial because there's so much blood, but you just won't get that big spurting several inches out of the wound. It'll just be this kind of constant heavy ooze. Typically easy to stop with direct pressure. If it's in a deep fat wound, it can be harder. You may have to put a finger into the wound. You may have to try to open up the wound to find it. Maybe clamp it with a hemostat. Those are all easy things to do. If you still can't fix it, a tourniquet works. But in a big venous bleed, is a tourniquet going to work that way? The blood's coming from the opposite direction, right? So typically, venous bleeds, you can stop with direct pressure or pressure damage. Pretty hard to, to not have a venous bleed. Arterial hemorrhages. So this is easy in the field. They squirt several inches. They're obvious. Everybody knows they're arterial. You put direct pressure there. Typically, you can stop it. If it's like a femoral gunshot wound, those can be a friggin' nightmare, okay, because there's so much blood, they're losing it so fast, it's hard to keep up. They're likely going to be dead by the time you get there. Um, but this is where tourniquets come into play very quickly, when you realize they're bleeding, they're hemorrhaging immensely from a bad wound, and you know it's arterial, it's spurting, it's gushing blood. When you come up on scene, so quickly you're going to go through your algorithm when it happens, you're going to just go into the mode of, holy crap, you apply direct pressure, I'm getting the tourniquet out. <coughs> and you're just going to you're just going to know when you see those bleeds, you get so used to it of, ah, that's no big deal, versus, holy crap, we need a tourniquet now. So this is a fun picture. So <laughs> I kept it in here. Obviously, capillary venous. 
some reason the wind's blowing here and blowing the blood. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously it's a turn, and, but that's fine. I just like that picture. So hemostasis. I think we're going to breeze through this area pretty quickly. Uh, yes, you need to know how you form clots. Is it going to affect your EMS career? Not a whole lot, okay? The gist of it is, when you get an injury, like I'll cut through the, through the skin, the first thing that notices the problem is your vessel. It's going to say, ouch, I was just cut in half. So the vessel's going to react. It's going to tighten up. That's why a lot of times, uh, if you've ever seen an amputation in the field, you'll be amazed at how little blood there is. Because the vessel's all, you know, if it's a stretching pull, the arm got ripped off versus chopped off in a car crash. Uh, the vessels from that tensile getting pulled, their reaction is to, I'm going to tighten up. I'm freaked out. I was just injured. I'm tightening up. And so surprisingly, there'll be not nearly as much blood as you'd expect on scene. Now, if you take somebody who slit their wrist this way and went right down the artery, tons of blood on scene or a head wound, tons of blood, but an arm pulled off, a leg pulled off, you might be surprised how little there is. So the first phase is the vascular phase where the vessel reacts. The second one is now you have an injured vessel, blood flowing through it, and these things called platelets in the blood, that their whole job is to constantly roll around in the blood vessels looking for damage and helping fix it. So they roll around and they have sensors on them, these little chemoreceptors that find this damaged piece of the vessel wall and they go, oh crap, I'm going to link up here. And they stop and link up, they activate and they start clumping up together like a big party and that's what starts the clot formation. Okay. So your platelets then is the next phase, followed by the coagulation phase. They set off this chain of events that kicks in your coagulation factors. There's lots of factors. The important thing to know about factors is that some of the medications you will come into contact with, like Coumadin and Pradaxa and these weird medications people are on for blood thinners, they act on specific factors. And that's why you need to know about there are clotting factors. The whole job is to help form a clot. There's this pathway, a cascade, a coagulation cascade, where this factor activates this factor, which activates this factor, and then this factor is activated, which activates fibrin, which then helps form the clot. It's this cascade. And why some of these blood thinners work is they act in somewhere in that cascade that come in and stop it. And then that allows you to not form clots. And it thins your blood. And then if you fall and bop your head, you bleed like it. So big. But Really, fibrin's in there, it forms this clot, so really that's what you need to know about that three-step thing. you got the vessel reaction, the platelets, and then the clotting factors kick in. Um, the nature of the wound, that pull versus cut, yeah, it affects it. Are you going to care in the field? No. You're going to care about are they gushing blood or not. So this is kind of that example. Obviously, this one's going to gush blood. This one's probably going to tighten down and start contracting and decrease blood. Uh, oh. So bleeding. If somebody has a big bleed from falling off a cliff or their bike and breaking their leg and they're gushing out blood, and you come on scene and the bleeding's improved, but now they got a deformity. Well, a lot of these deep vessels are deep for protection. The body is beautiful in how it's arranged. So your core carries all the important stuff. If you've ever seen the spinal column in a patient, uh, this doesn't show very much, there's no skin. So the spinal cord, people always think it's right you know, in the back, right? Spinal cord's in the back. If you look at the human body, like on a CT skin, when we take these pictures, we really cut through it. So you got skin and fat, skin and fat, and you got these big spinous processes, which is what you feel in the person's back. Then you got the giant vertebrae, and the spinal cord, if you ever see it on a CT scan, is almost dead center in the middle of your whole body. That's how beautiful, it's so protected. And your aorta, right by that, way deep in the middle of the body. So your big vessels, are typically deep. So my deep arteries are by the bones. So that's why if you get a bad fracture, you can have damage to a major vessel and they bleed. And then you come on scene and you're trying to stabilize and immobilize this thing and splint it, move a little bit, and a bunch more blood starts coming out. It's because you've re-injured things and disrupted any clot that's forming. So you gotta be careful if you're trying to move things around on an obvious fracture or dislocation. Body temperature, you mentioned it in that podcast. Cold temp makes it harder to clot, okay? 
so that shuts down, and then you got that trifecta of death. So here's <laughs> four stages of hemorrhage. Memorize this, right? No, not at all. Don't, don't memorize it. If you're tested on it, oh, that's so sad. But uh, <laughs> the percentages, no, don't memorize it. This is said like class one compensated, blah, 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 right? So tachycardia and you know, class two. Yeah. The, you're never going to need to know this in the field. What you need to know is why am I seeing what I'm seeing? Why is the guy's, why is the cap refill six seconds? Why is the edema? Why is his heart rate really fast? What can I predict is going to happen next? There's where the learning comes in. Is not only can you say, this guy's in shock. I know this is shock. I'm going to start this medication. But then take the next level as a paramedic. This is when your education really kicks in. You start going, this is cool. I'm doing cool stuff. Is when you start thinking, OK, I'm going to do this, but I expect this to happen first. So I'm going to get my fluids and levofed ready. I'm going to put the patient in this position, but I bet his blood pressure is going to go down to about this level before the levofed kicks in, and I want the levofed to take his blood pressure to this level with the fluids. But he's a heart patient, so if I give him too many fluids, I bet I start to cause some shortness of breath. Maybe I'll hear it some wet lung sounds. At that point, I'm going to stop giving the fluids and only give the levofed. And you're going to start thinking like that, and you're going to be like, I'm starting to predict stuff. This is cool. And you start realizing that it's not about the numbers, the percentages, it's about the patient, how they look, and you keep reassessing them. Constant reassessment. Okay? Class three. <laughs> okay. So again, here you keep seeing this stuff come up. Tachypnea, fast breathing. Under, uh, level of responsiveness decreases, that's bad. Diaphoresis, there's that scary one that scares me. Okay? Patient's cool. You're an output. That's, that's a tough one, okay? You, you're with them for 15 minutes. The fact that they didn't pee in that 15 minutes, that doesn't prove anything. Right? All right. And then we keep going through this. People are getting, they're dying. Let's take a break. <coughs> Anybody have any questions?